ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಐ ಎಂ ಮನೋರಮ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಯು ಟು ದ ನೂಪುರ ಭ್ರಮರಿ ಶ್ರವಣ ಸರಣಿ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಎಪಿಸೋಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಶ್ರವಣ ಮನನ ನಿಧಿಧ್ಯಾಸನ ಇಸ್ ಅ ತ್ರೀ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಲ್ಯಾಡರ್ ಟು ಕ್ಲೈಮ್ ದ ವೇ ಆಫ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟು ಗೆಟ್ ರೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವಿದ್ಯ ಆಸ್ ಭಾರತೀಯ ದರ್ಶನ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿ profoundly points out listenership is the first and foremost factor which drive towards any particular goal from birth to death it plays pivotal role to make life more meaningful if it been aptly addressed this shravana sarani series also aims to those areas which helps to understand the form and content of our sanatana parampara has discussed but over a period of time it has been placed behind the curtains we are extremely happy and delighted to thank the scholars and listeners who are part of this this episode brings shri arjun bharadwaj from bangalore he is a writer translator and engineer he is well versed in sanskrita kannada english german and greek and also enjoys composing poems set to poetic meters in all these languages arjun's research interest lies in comparative study of classical greek and sanskrita aesthetics Apart from writing several essays and research papers he has co-authored co-translated many of the work many of the works he has a deep interest in classical literature dramaturgy dance and music today he is presenting his ideas on chaturvida abhinaya in kalidasa's kumara sambhavam how poetry to be read how to interpret do dhvani suggestions enhance the reading what kind of benefit we can draw off how should we dramatize the poetry is there the necessity of founding chaturvida abhinaya in it how it enhance the visibility in viewer so many questions will be dealt with examples in the series with the base of world famous sanskrit mahakavya kumara sambhava of kalidasa now let's welcome shri arjun bharadwaj for this series and thanks for his participation ಚಿಂದಕಲಾಂವಾಣೀ ವಂದೇ ಚಂದ್ರಕಲಾಧರ ನೈರ್ಮಲ್ಯತಾರತಮ್ಯನ ಬಿಂಬಿತ ಚಿತ್ತಿಷು ನಮಸ್ಸರ್ವೇಭ್ಯ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಟು ಒನ್ ಆಲ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಔಟ್ ಸೆಟ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮನೋರಮ ಬಿ ಎನ್ ಆಫ್ ನೂಪುರ ಭ್ರಮರಿ ಫಾರ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಮಿ ದಿಸ್ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ಎ ಟಾಕ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಚತುರ್ವಿಧಾಭಿನಯ ಇನ್ ದ ಕುಮಾರ ಸಂಭವಂ ಆಫ್ ಕಾಳಿದಾಸ i would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to shatavadhani dr r ganesh who initiated me on a holistic study of the presence of fine arts in the works of kalidasa so this topic that i'm going to talk about which is chaturvidha abhinaya in the kumara sambhavam mahakavya of kalidasa is a sub component of this bigger study about the presence of fine arts and different forms of classical arts in the works of kalidasa as we all know chaturvidha abhinaya are the four modes of communication or the four modes of abhinaya four modes of aesthetic communication that is used in a natya natya means a theater art or a theatrical presentation so the four modes of communication are defined by bharata in his natya shastra and though the definition is of indian origin 
like I mentioned, it is defined by Bharata, but the applicability is universal. So any theater art form around the world that we take today or of uh, the ancient times or any movie that we see today, we can apply the concept of the Chaturvidha Abhinaya to analyze them. And even in the process of creating the movie or the theatrical uh, form, the director would have consciously or unconsciously made use of all these four elements anyway. The first one is the Aharya Abhinaya, which is the communication through at the level of costumes, through props, that is the stage properties, through lighting and other elements. The second is the Angika Abhinaya, which is the communication through the body language, the gesture language, through the face and different limbs of the body. Vachika Abhinaya, which is communication through speech and also through music. And Sattvika Abhinaya, which is the communication through involuntary reactions of our body. For example, tears or ashru is a reaction of our body when we as actors are involved deeply in a scene. For example, if we have to display the sequence where Sita is kidnapped by Ravana, if the actor or the actress who is playing the role of Sita is intensely involved in the situation, she actually steps into the shoes of Sita, she actually understands the heart of Sita, then she'll actually get tears in her eyes because of the pain that uh, is being inflicted upon her by Ravana. So this is an involuntary reaction. One cannot get it whenever one wants. So only when a person goes deep into the character, the Sattvika Abhinaya will come out. So similarly, there are other elements uh, such as Romancha or horripilation, getting goosebumps, or vivarnia, change in facial color. So when we are angry, our face may turn red. When we are sad, it might change into another color, etc. So there is a change in facial features and facial color and the bodily color also, depending on the different emotional states of our mind. So these are the four modes of Abhinaya, which is present in a theatrical tradition, in the Natya. So using these four modes of communication, an artist on the stage can effectively communicate anything that he wants. But just imagine, on the contrast, a poet, a kavi, an epic poet, only has vachika, that is communication through words, as the only mode of expression. Let us quickly take an overview of the advantages that are inherently present for an actor because of the presence of the four modes of Abhinaya against the hindrances that a poet may feel because he has to bring the effect of all the four modes of Abhinaya only through speech, only through words. Let us take the popular story of Ramayana. If we have to establish a character or if we have to establish a sequence to communicate to the audience where the sequence is taking place, the props themselves tell. If uh, there are trees made out of whatever thermocol or cardboard which are used as stage properties, that itself communicates that it is the scene is happening in a forest. And if a character who is dressed in the costume of a Rakshasi enters on the stage, we immediately connect to what it is, who the character is. The costume reveals a lot. The costume communicates a lot to us about the nature of the character, the mannerisms of the character, the potential rasas that the character might evoke. For example, if when as soon as Shurpanaka enters on the stage, her costumes and her gait, her bodily mannerisms, that itself reveals volumes of information to us, volumes of emotion to us. There is Raudra, Bhibatsa, Bhayanaka, Rasas that immediately get triggered as soon as she enters on the stage because of the costumes that she has and because of the bodily features and the mannerisms that she has on the stage. Similarly, if you take the case of Sita or Shakuntala, they would be wearing delicate costumes and they would have certain other bodily features and bodily mannerisms. So their presence on the stage itself communicates a lot to us. But just imagine all this has to be captured in the form of words by the poet. Through words, he'll have to communicate this entire effect, which the three-dimensional perspective that an audience to a theater presentation would have had, all that will have to be captured through words. Similarly, in a theater presentation, in an artya, in a play or a drama, 
there is so much that can be communicated by the gesture language, that is the Angika Abhinaya. The wink of an eye communicates so much. Just turning of the face communicates so much. It can communicate rejection. It can uh, communicate shyness in the case of Shungara, etc. And an Alupadma Hasta or the wave of a hand can communicate volumes. But to bring the effect of any of these is quite a challenge for an epic poet. And thirdly, there is Vachika Abhinaya. Although the poet's medium itself is Vachika, the Vachika that comes as a part of Natya is multidimensional because the Vachika in Natya has the component of music. So music can trigger or it can give the background for several different emotions, like different ragas, different swaras, intensify different rasas, as we very well know. But the poet does not have the privilege of using music in his work. And also the Vachika in a theater art has an element of Lokadharmi. Lokadharmi in the sense, let us imagine that there are two characters on the stage. They are talking to each other using the normal colloquial language like we would communicate to each other in our day-to-day -day lives. But just imagine the plight of an epic poet who is writing a Mahakavya. He is bound by the Chandas. So the presence of the Chandas or the metrical pattern or a versified form of expression is itself stylized. There is stylization that is inherent to a chandas. And because of the stylization, there is a kind of anvaya klesha. Anvaya klesha would mean roughly jumbling of words in the verse. And you would need to have a separate parsing to determine the word order and to extract the meaning. Right. So that is the epic poet's mode of expression is a stylized vachika. So he doesn't have the privilege of using music. He doesn't have the privilege of using Lokadharmi kind of Vajika. So at the outset, it appears that the poet is verily handicapped, right? Because he has chosen his medium to be this, a versified form of Vajika expression. And fourthly, the Sattvika Abhinaya, which is very powerful in a theater, in a performing art, in a, in a theatrical art. Just imagine there is a character on the stage who, because of the depth of his or her involvement, sheds tears on the stage. It will immediately capture the hearts of the audience and they would have so much of empathy, sympathy. They'll feel for the character very well. Just a couple of droplets of tears will capture the hearts of the audience immediately. But just imagine if an epic poet says that the character shed tears or a certain character in an epic novel sheds tears that's mere fact that he's stating. For it to translate into a value as in an experiential feeling, it's very difficult for the audience of an epic poem only. But those tears, when shed by an actor on a stage, it immediately translates into an experience for the audience. So it becomes a value there. So these difficulties are faced by an epic poet. He doesn't have the four modes of expression which a person practicing Natya would naturally have. Having said this, we still know that the Kumara Sambhava of Kalidasa is an extraordinary kavya. It's a Mahakavya which has stood the test of times and people of different age groups, of different backgrounds have always enjoyed the Kumara Sambhava. So what are the elements that are present in the Kumara Sambhava which makes it enjoyable? And me, with my personal experience, whenever I read the Kumara Sambhava, I actually have a play, a drama that is playing in my mind. I'm able to imagine the characters and the situations in flesh and blood. I'm able to imagine the background, like uh, the scenery, which is around uh, the place where the event is taking place. I'm able to imagine the physical features of uh, the characters who come there. I'm able to imagine the facial expressions they have. And a conscious connoisseur can even imagine the tonality of the voice with which each of the different characters who come as a part of Kumara Sambhava is speaking in, right? We can even imagine the Sattvika Abhinaya, like tears, horripilation, sweat, which the characters might be feeling at different points of time in the story. So what is it which makes Kumara Sambhava so beautiful and so enjoyable? And it has the dramatic element in it, where we actually play a drama in our minds at the arena 
of our minds. So this uh, study is an attempt to explore the inherent elements of Chaturvidha Abhinaya which are present in Kalidasa's Kumarasambhava. Sometimes the elements of Chaturvidha Abhinaya might be explicitly present and sometimes it might be implicitly present in the sense that the elements of Abhinaya may be suggestive at times and at other times it could be explicitly stated. There is this very famous statement of Bhattatavata, who was the teacher of Abhinava Gupta. He says, Prayogatva manapanne kavye naswada sambhavaha. It means that a poem or a kavya cannot be enjoyed if it cannot be staged unless there are elements in the kavya which make it presentable in an audiovisual medium as an atya, unless it is possible to do so, it won't be enjoyable. The aswada, the enjoyment element will be lesser. So that's what Bhattatauta says. So I don't think, in my view, that he's saying that all the kavyas should be actually put on stage. He's trying to say that every kavya should evoke that dramatic element that Natyaya Manata in the in the mental arena of the Konoshiyas. So it should create the dramatization in the minds of the Konoshiyas and the Natyaya Manata should be inbuilt in the Kavya. Although it's Vachika is the only medium of expression in the Kavya. He also says at another place, Anubhava Vibhavanam Varanana Kavya Mujyate Teshameva Prayogastu Natyam Gitadi Ranjitam. So what is he saying there? When the Anubhava and the Vibhavas are explicitly shown, are concretely shown on the stage. They trigger the Sthai Bhava and the Sthai Bhava along with Anubhava, Vibhava and the Vyabhichari Bhavas can give us the experience of a Rasa. So when they are explicitly staged, it becomes Natya. And when they are described, when there is a Varnana of Anubhava and Vibhava, it becomes a Kavya. So what I am trying to do here is deconstruct the Kavya and to see the inherent elements of Anubhava and Vibhava which are already present there and the Anubhava and Vibhavas should come in the form of Chaturvida Abhinaya and all of them together trigger the element of Rasa. That is what makes it ultimately enjoyable. That gives the effect of Natya Yamanata or dramatization in the Konojiya's mind. Philosophically, the Kumara Sambhavam is itself a story of the graduation of Parvati from the level of Aharya and Angika to the level of Sattvika. It's her graduation from the level of Vachika to transcending Vachika or Vachanatita, from words to transcending words, from the level of material ornamentation and physical charm, transcending, graduating, to the, getting elevated to the level of realizing inner beauty the sattvika within her, realizing the sattvika shiva within her, the atma saundarya that's within her. So it's a very philosophical epic, first of all. Similarly, there are several layers in the epic poem. Manmata, who comes with all the ornamentation, with all the aharya, the nature itself provides the uddipana vibhava for Manmata, the deity of love. He comes with Vasanta, he comes with Malay Maruta, he comes with Rati. So he totally equipped in the Aharya, he is completely equipped in the sense of Angika. But then he gets reduced to ashes and a Manmata who was Sangha becomes Ananga. From the level of physical love, it graduates to the level of Shungara Rasa, which is an experience which is to be had. From the level of Kama, it graduates to the level of Shungara Rasa. So it's going from the concrete to the abstract. Because this is the undercurrent of the entire Kumara Sambhavam, there are inherently the elements of Angika, Aharya, Vajika and Sattvika are present. And the very name Kumara Sambhava is meaningful. The union of Shiva and Parvati is to give rise to Kumara. It brings to our mind a statement of Kalidasa which he makes in his other epic poem, the Raghuvamsha, Prajayai Gruhamedhinam. The union of the male and the female, the Gruhastashrama, is meant for the production of good citizens, noble citizens, for the country, for the welfare of the world. So the spiritual union between Shiva and Parvati is for the material welfare of the world, to give birth to this Kumara. And 
it's so interesting that they call him Kumara as the son. He's not even given an explicit name, a name of his own. The genius of a poet that Kalidasa is, he just names him Kumara. It's also the transition of Parvati, Stavara Raja Kanya, to become Uma and then to become Shiva, a part of Shiva. Shiva who shooed her away as uh, she was just a three Sannikarsha. He wanted to avoid any contact with a lady. Later, sees spiritual graduation that Parvati has and he gives his own body for her to share. He himself becomes Ardhanarishwara, a lady who he had avoided, who he had shooed away in the past. Later, he makes space in his own body for her to live. Or in other words, Shiva makes his house in her body. It can be seen in either ways, Ardhanarishwara. So it's a very philosophically, creatively profound work of art. The beautiful damsel Parvati, the daughter of the rich Parvataraja, Parvati, she does that Ukra Tapas and her mother forbids her from doing that by saying Uma. And then she graduates to become Shiva, the level of Adibhuta, Adhidheva and Adhyatma. From the level of Adiputa, she is graduating to the level of Adhyatma. So there are several layers of meanings in the name Kumarasambhava and there is a Prabhanta Dvani in the entire epic. Let me give a few samples from the Kumarasambhavam where some elements of Angika Bhaniya and Sattvika Bhaniya are explicitly present and some other instances where they are implied where they are suggested or they are left to the imagination of the Kunoshya. Couple of straightforward instances are from the Trutiya Sarga, the third Sarga of the Kumarasambhavam. In the 41st Sloka, there is a lot of commotion that we see around the place where Shiva is performing his tapas and Nandi, who is uh, supposed to be standing at the entrance of uh, Shiva's tapovana, he is annoyed with the kind of disturbance that uh, Akala Vasanta untimely arrival of spring is creating. So he makes all the people become silent just with one of his gestures, a very powerful gesture that he does. And the entire environment freezes. All the couples who were enjoying together, they all stop amidst their actions. So that is the famous verse which goes, Mukarpi taikanguli sanyayeva so with just one finger on his mouth, he asked everybody to be silent. There was no Vachika, there was no Angika and the Aharya froze. So that is what we can imagine just by this one Angika of Nandi. Similarly, there are other explicit cases of Angika Abhinaya. For instance, in the Trutiya Sarga again, in the 60th verse, Nandi, he permits Parvati to enter the Tapovana of Shiva, just by a twitch of his eyebrow. Praveshayama sacha bharturenam brukshepa matranu mata pravesham. So it's just the brukshepa, just raising of one eyebrow. With that he permitted her. So one eyebrow movement communicates a lot of message to Parvati. And he doesn't even speak. So we see these explicit instances of Angika Abhinaya. However, there are several instances where we need to imagine the Angika Abhinaya. For instance, there is a verse in the 6th Sarga of uh, the Kumara Sambhava. There, the Saptarshis along with Arundhati would have gone to the palatial residence of uh, Parvataraja and they would have gone on behalf of Shiva to ask Parvati's hand in marriage so there, when they go, Parvataraja introduces himself and his wife and daughter. So there, the Parvataraja's words are as follows. Ete vayam ami daraha kanyeyam kula jivitam. So what does it translate to? It, if we have to do an explicit translation, these are us, these are wives, this is daughter, who is my life. This is exactly what he is saying. But if we have to, if we imagine the verse without any Angika, it would be meaningless. So the Angika is implicit here. So we are, a cultured Konoshya would naturally imagine that when the Parvataraja is speaking, he would be pointing at himself when he says, Ete Vayam. 
this is me. He is using Vayam as a royal V there. Ete Vayam, this is us. He is pointing to himself. Ami Daraha. He only has one wife, like we know, but uh, he is using the respectful plural there. And Daraha is a Nitya Bahuvachana. It's a respectful plural for wife. And so he must be pointing at her when he says Daraha. And when he says Kanyeyam Kulajivitam, he must be pointing at Parvati who should have been standing at his side, who is next to him or slightly behind him. So Kalidasa gives so much of space for the Kunojya to imagine what's actually going on there. However, if this were to come as a part of a Natya, when everything is explicitly shown, there's not much scope for the Kunojya to imagine. Here in Akavya, because of the elements of suggestivity that comes through, as per his own culturing of mind, as per his own samskaras, the Konoshya can have different kinds of imagine the Aharya, the Angika, the Vachika, Sattvika, as per his own background. Nairmalya taratamyena bimbitam chitta bhittishu. So this is exact line from the shloka that I recited at the beginning of this uh, presentation. Depending on how clean, how clear our mental canvases are, how nicely made our mental arena is, that clearly we will be able to imagine the situations, the emotions and the characters in our mental plane. Let me now take a couple of instances which suggest Sattvika and Angika Abhinaya. And these suggestions are also to be felt by the Rasika. So in the second Sarga of the Kumara Sampava, the Devatas go to Brahma seeking help. They are being troubled by Tarakasura and they are in a lot of agony and they want to ask Brahma for a solution. So if we imagine this on a stage, we would be able to witness several Devas going on the stage they would, and we'll be able to identify the devas based on the aharya that they are wearing, the costumes that they are wearing and the lanchanas that uh, they have, like uh, the different symbols that each of the devatas have or based on the ayudha or the weapon that each one of them is holding, we'll be able to identify the devatas. So with hundreds, hundred of them coming on the stage, immediately we get a sense of the number of people, the number of characters and who they are, all their identity, everything will be revealed at the same time. And we'll also get a feel of the facial expression that they have. Uh, looking at the faces, we'll be able to understand the uh, mindset and the emotion in them at this uh, sequence. So that's the advantage which a Natya can provide. But how should a poet capture the quantity, that is the number of Devas who are on the stage, and the quality, that is the emotion with which they have gone. To do that, Kalidasa writes a poem in the second Sarga. Tesham avira bhut pramha parim lana mukhashriyam sarasam supta padmanam pratar dhiditi maniva. So all these uh, devas went to Brahma Loka seeking an audience with him. And Brahma appeared there. He materialized there quite magically there was brightness on their faces. So, Brahma comes there as a ray of hope. But poet, however, puts it very beautifully. So, he says, the faces, he suggests that the faces of the devas were like lotuses with their petals closed down, like they would be at night. And when the sun comes in the morning, all of them will open up. They all blossom because the sun has provided light and heat and love to them. So they have this ray of hope and they smile when the sun comes. So that's exactly what is happening here. But there are several layers of meanings here. The devas are like lotuses. They have the fragrance of the lotuses. Their touch, their skin and their clothing is as soft, as delicate as the lotus. And just as a lotus at night when it has closed its petals, according to most uh, poetic conventions, and also as we see in nature, there are dew drops on the petals of the lotus when, they are, uh, when the petals are closed down. So we can even imagine that these dew drops are like the tears on the faces of the devas, or it could even be perspiration because of sweat, because they are all scared of uh, Tarakasura. 
So it's either due to fear that they have sweat or due to pain that they have tears in their eyes. Though the poet does not explicitly say this, it would not beat the aesthetics of the poem if a conscious connoisseur extracts these layers of meanings behind this imagery. So the devas are delicate like the lotuses. They are fragrant people. They are full of fragrance. But now all their brightness has uh, gone down. They have all closed their faces. They had become dull. But with Brahma appearing there, they all have a pained smile probably on their faces because Brahma comes as a ray of hope and there is some hope, but still the pain is not permanently gone. So we can imagine all these layers of meanings. And when he says, Sarasam Supta Padmanam, that actually gives us a kind of feel about the number of devas who have gone there and the feeling with which they have gone. What is the emotion that's present on their face? How the coming of Brahma would have uh, rekindled their hope? All that is left to the imagination of a Konoshya. And then one after the other, Brahma starts observing one deva after the other. And he recognizes that there is something seriously wrong with all of them. He looks at uh, Indra. It's not just Indra who is dull, but even his Vajrayuta has become dull. So there is this superimposition of Sattvika Abhinaya on an element of Aharya. So Vajrayuda is also personified here, as though it has a feeling. So the brilliance that Vajrayuda is supposed to have, the lightning, the bolt of lightning, which is supposed to strike down enemies, and the seven-colored rainbow, which it usually used to, used to create, that is also gone and it has turned gray. Brahma sees Indra and observes this. So the Kshatra protection, which the Vajrayuda was supposed to give, that is not there. And also the seven colored rainbow, the colors of life that Indra was supposed to give to the world, even that is gone. The entire world has become gray. So that's what uh, he is saying there. Brahma observes that. So in the second verse, which I mentioned before this, Sarasam Supta Padmana, there the poet is uh, describing uh, the devas and uh, the appearance of Brahma. There Kavi Praudhokti is acting. When Brahma himself speaks, the poet is using Kavi Nibadda Praudhokti. He is making a character of his creation speak. So in both the ways, in Kavi Praudhokti and in Kavi Nibadda Praudhokti, Kalidasa is bringing the elements of the four Abhinayas. We go ahead and uh, we see that Brahma looks at Varuna. His Pasha, which is supposed to kill the enemy, is supposed to regulate the world order. So he is uh, to maintain the Ruta, the cosmic order of the world. That looks like a dead snake. So there is this Raju Sarpa Branti. So the noose itself, the Pasha itself that Varuna is carrying, that itself has lost its strength. So it's like a dead snake without any poison. Brahma observes Yama and he makes this statement. Yamopi vilikan bhumim dande nastam itatvisha kurutesmin amokhepi nirvana lata lagavam. So Yama supposedly carries his Yama danda, which is the dharma danda, which is supposed to establish dharma on earth and the swarga. But that danda lost its strength. And what has it been reduced to? It has been reduced to a burnt piece of charcoal. Yama is using that danda to just scratch on the ground. And he has put his head down. He has hung his head low out of embarrassment. Of, he's ashamed of himself because he's not able to control the world order. A big degradation of value is what the poet is suggesting here. So he has superimposed the sattvika element on an element of aharya. We can imagine the facial expression that Yama might have had with his head hung low, he might have got tears, he might have got sweat on his face because Brahma, who is the master, is going to question Yama now. Why are things out of control? So he might be scared of being questioned. The Dhvani is left to the Konoshiya's imagination. However, if this had come in an Antya, we would have explicitly seen the expression on uh, Yama's face and uh, uh, his body language. So our imagination would have been limited to what is actually shown on the stage. But in the Kavya, it is triggering layers of imagination, layers of Dhvani. And again, as per the culturing of the mind that the Konoshir has, he'll be able to imagine different layers of meaning. And lastly, we'll go to one famous verse, again from the second Svarga. 
Brahma finally asks Indra what is the problem. Indra looks at his teacher, Bruhaspati, who has come with them. Bruhaspati is, after all, Vachaspati. He is the lord of Vachika. He is the one who has mastered speech. So whatever the problem the devas have, it's only Vachaspati, the speech master, who can report it to Brahma. To describe that situation, Indra requesting the Deva Guru, Bruhaspati, to spell out their problem. Kalidasa uses the following words. Tato manda nilodhuta kamala karashobhina gurum netra sahasrena nudaya masa vasavaha. So with so much of alliteration here, especially in the last line, we see that it's a soft and delicate thing that the poet is indicating. Indra, according to the Puranas, has thousand eyes. and all the thousand eyes slowly turned towards Bruhaspati. So it was like a cool breeze blowing over a pond full of lotuses, a pond full of thousand lotuses. So the eyes of Indra are like lotuses and all of them at the same time they turn towards Bruhaspati. So how difficult this would be to bring through Natya. Poet has so easily captured it through words. All the thousand eyes at one time pointing, looking at Bruhaspati. So this would have been almost impossible in Natya. In contrast, when Indra calls Manmata to give him an order to make sure that Shiva and Parvati unite together, there, Sahasramakshnam Yugapat Papata there's a contrast in the way the poet uses. There, Indra is the master and uh, Manmata is the servant who has come. In that instance, the poet says that the hundred eyes of Indra at the same time fell on Manmata. The master's glance can always be heavy when he is giving instructions or commands to a servant. But when he has to address a person who is superior to him, here, Bruhaspati is superior to Indra in a sense. So he'll slowly turn his eyes towards Bruhaspati and with his eyes he'll instigate Bruhaspati to tell. So we can imagine all the Netra Bhinaya, all the facial expressions that Indra might have had in the two different instances. One while he's requesting Bruhaspati and the other when he's commanding Manmata. To bring the effect, this kind of effect of thousand eyes is almost impossible. Through Natya. With this, I would like to conclude. Thank you all for your kind hearing.